I'm grateful you're watching and listening to this message. I hope that through what you hear, you really grow to understand what God says and how much he has shown his love for you in Jesus. As God's word is open, I pray that he speaks to you. And listen, if it would be helpful for you to talk to someone, please reach out. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Again, thank you for watching. Uh, this morning, I will be reading from Exodus 28, uh, verses 1 through 12, as we continue our series um, through this book. Have your brother Aaron with his sons come to you from the Israelites to serve me as priests? Aaron, his sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, make holy garments for your brother Aaron for glory and beauty. You to instruct all the skilled artisans whom I have filled with a spirit of wisdom to make Aaron's garments for consecrating him to serve me as priest. These are the garments that must, that must make a breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a specially woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. They are to make the holy garments for your brother Aaron and his sons so that they may serve me as priests. They should use gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and fine linen. They are to make the ephod of finely spun linen embroidered with a gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. It must have two shoulder pieces attached to its two edges so that it can be joined together. The artistically woven waistband that is on the ephod must be of one piece, according to the same workmanship of gold, of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and of finely spun linen. Take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of Israel's sons, six of their names on the first stone and the remaining six names on the second stone in the order of their birth. Engrave the two stones with the names of Israel's sons as a gem cutter engraves a seal. Mount them surrounded with gold filigree settings. Fasten both stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as memorial stones for the Israelites. Aaron will carry their names on his two shoulders before the Lord as a reminder. Thank you, Holly, for reading. And I was just reminded, like, I kind of head down and getting into the worship service, but we, we had an amazing weekend this weekend with one weekend. It was at Disciple Now with our students. If you participated in that, whether you were a host home or one of the leaders or one of the students, could you raise your hand? So there's several of you here. I heard great, great things. Thank you, church family, for ste stepping up and serving. Uh, it really was a good weekend. I look forward to hearing more and more stories of what God did, but um, just had a ton of students here and kind of takes a whole church family leaning in to make that a special weekend. So thank you on behalf of uh, your staff. I, we just greatly, greatly appreciate how deeply our church invests in teenagers and students. Keep your Bible open there in Exodus 28. But to begin, I'd like to ask you a question. If, if God loved a person or God loved a group of people so much that he wanted to meet with them, what do you think that would look like? If God made a decisive choice, if God exercised his will to not just meet with people, but to actually live with people, to dwell with a group of people, to be there on their good days and on their bad days, to be with them when they experience all kinds of joy and when they experience all kinds of grief, on those moments where they feel super high and on those moments where they feel totally lost. What would it look like for God to dwell with people, to meet with people in that capacity? And I don't know what naturally, you know, where your head goes, what you would say, well, it would, I think it would look like this, or I think it would look like that. We actually get our first glimpse of what that would look like post Garden of Eden. We get our first glimpse of that in the book of Exodus. We get a look at what it's what it will be like when God once makes the decisive choice in love to meet with people, to live among them. And several chapters, actually in Exodus, what's interesting is several chapters actually go into preparing that to happen. So it, it takes like several chapters, more chapters than it des describing the Exodus. It takes all these chapters in Exodus to set the table for what it would look like for God to then live among his people. It's like all kinds of detail. It actually starts, and we looked at this last week, it starts with all these preparations that have to be made for a tent called 
a tent of meeting. And so Pastor Kevin took us through that last week. And all of that is not even God dwelling. That is just God preparing to dwell. All the, the tent and the furniture and everything that had to be set up for that to happen. I mean, chapter after chapter after chapter of the Bible. Then you come over into what we're looking at today, and it's not just places, like places that had to be prepared, but it's people that had to be prepared. There had to be this go-between between God and people who are sinful, a holy God and sinful people. And so there are all kinds of chapters about that, the go-between. We call them priests. And actually, in our passage today, you heard it read that there's like preparation that has to go into what the priest would wear, his clothes. So what does it look like when God dwells with people? Well, the answer in Exodus, is it starts with a tent, and then it moves to clothes that the priest would wear. And clothes may not be your thing. You may not be much of a clothes horse. And so you may go like, really, we're going to talk a while about clothes? I think there are some amazing connections that you're going to see with the clothes that the priest had to wear and how they were all prepared before the priest even did one act of sacrifice, one act of atonement, one act of mediation to bring like God and people together. Before that ever happened, there's all kinds of description. But it isn't just about a tent and about clothes. It's also about a ceremony. And again, the ceremony that you'll, you'll see, and we'll spend a little bit of time in, in Exodus 29, the ceremony is, again, just to prepare the priest and prepare everything for atonement to be made, for reconciliation to be made. So we're, we have chapter after chapter after chapter just saying, you know what it's going to take for God to live with people? It's going to take a ton of preparation. God has to set the table, prepare things prepare what the priest is going to wear, prepare all the, this whole ceremony. And, you know, that's not my first reflex. You know, my first reflex is, you know what it's going to take for God to live with people is they better behave. They better straighten up because he sees everything. He knows everything. And, and if they don't want to get incinerated, they better make a whole lot of promises, better keep those promises. If God's going to dwell with people, he's a holy God. That holiness never changes. But notice, and I want us to dig deep. So again, you'll, you'll have to like, we'll, we'll have to cross a little bit of a divide here in going back into ancient clothes and ancient ceremonies. But I think in the end, you'll see some categories and some connections. Maybe, maybe you've never appreciated quite to the detail you have. When we talk about these clothes, Again, so let's take a step back in time across cultures and all that. Maybe the best analogy that I could give you is some of you love like all things royal family. So when there's the wedding and there's all the ceremony, some of you took off work to watch that, all, all that go on. The ceremonies and, and even the funerals and the coronations and there's all this pageantry, isn't there? And and so you can think of that, or you think of Inauguration Day, where there's all these symbols and all these words and formulas, or, or maybe it'd be helpful for you to think of, like when we talk about clothes, to think of like graduation ceremonies, where, I don't know, everybody marches in, and they've got all these robes, and they've got things on their arms, and they've got these strange hats, and they've got these medallions they're wearing, and there's all sorts of things that are said in, in a certain order and sequence. I think all of those kinds of things will help you understand and appreciate Okay, what's going on here? Why are we talking about ancient clothes and ancient ceremonies? So when God decides to meet with people, he starts with a tent and then he moves to a priest and the clothes they wear. And I just want to run through a, a few pieces of the clothes. We won't go through every single aspect of it. But, but notice there in verse 1, right, in Exodus 28, so God speaking says, have your brother Aaron with his sons come to you from the Israelites to serve me as priests. And then he says in verse two, make, make holy garments. The word holy shows up. I mean, it's all over the Bible, right? But it shows up a ton in this portion in Exodus. It's like you're constantly reading about holy and holiness and things being consecrated and ordained. Make holy garments garments. So what the priest is going to wear, the priest in the family is going to wear, is supposed to be set apart. Make holy garments for your brother Aaron, for glory, for beauty. 
and then get all the skilled artisans whom I've filled with the spirit of wisdom to make Aaron's garments for consecrating him. Again, all this is just preparation. This is not even saying what the priest does. It's just saying what he wears. And it's supposed to be glorious and beautiful. Skip on down to verse 9. So one piece of the garment is the ephod. And so we read about that in verse 9. It says, take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of Israel's sons. Think about that. Six on one of the stones, the other six on another stone. And then it says in verse 10, do that in the order of their birth and engrave the two stones with the names of Israel's sons as a gem cutter engraves the seal and mount them surrounded with gold, fasten both stones on the shoulder pieces uh, of the of the ephod as memorial stones. And, and listen to what it says there in verse 12, Aaron will carry. So when Aaron goes before the Lord, he will carry the names on his two shoulders before the Lord as a reminder, as a memorial, as something marking it, like an official record. Did you read that? So the names of the sons of Israel are written down. So what does it look like to meet with the Holy God? Well, to prepare for that, he says, write down these names, write down the names. And, and basically in those names, you have the last part of Genesis, first book of the Bible. And those names tell a terrible story. The birth order is interesting. Did you see that? It said, write them down in the order of their birth, each one of these sons, which that also invites all sorts of complexities and complications. The brothers hated each other. I mean, it's a terrible story. Those names, Exodus 1 starts with those names. Those names are so important to God that he said, I want you writing them on a gemstone, put them on the shoulder, and the priest, the go-between, is going to walk into my presence carrying those names and those stories, all of that family dysfunction, all of the hatred, all of the sin. He's going to carry people. That's what God wants in his presence. He wants people. He wants names. He wants that family that he selected, that he loves. They matter to him. the, The chapter goes on, and again, we're not reading every single verse, but another part of this says, and collect Moses is supposed to collect 12 gemstones, fancy special stones, and to make some sort of thing that would sit on the chest. Uh, It's called a breast piece, and it would sit on the chest. And again, there were 12 precious stones to symbolize the 12 tribes. So now you have the picture, like not just on the shoulders. So he's not just carrying it on his shoulders, but the priest, the high priest keeps it close to his heart. And each one of the names written down Each one of those stories, that family story matters to God. That family story matters to God. That family story. And signify, I mean, do we we appreciate? It says in verse 29, whenever, uh, and again, this is skipping down a little bit more. It says, whenever he enters the sanctuary, Aaron carries the names of Israel's sons over his heart. On the breastpiece for decisions, it's a continual reminder before the Lord. And then it says, place the Urim and the Thummim, which is a lot of scholars. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's some some way of making decisions, some way of giving guidance to the people of Israel. So put that, place the Urim and the Thummim in the breastpiece for decisions so that they will also be over Aaron's heart whenever he comes before the Lord. And Aaron will continually carry the means of decisions for the Israelites over his heart before the Lord. He goes to meet the Lord. There's something about that being close to the high priest's heart saying, not only am I carrying the weight of these stories on my shoulder, but it's very, very close to my heart. And he carries that into, again, we're not even talking, Aaron hasn't done one thing to sacrifice, one thing to atone. All this is just prep. Make this, make this ephod, make this breast piece in a certain way. Then verse 35, there's a robe and this robe is worn by Aaron whenever he ministers and and there, at the bottom of the robe are attached like bells. And, and those bells, as they ring, it's, it's announcing the arrival of Aaron, the high priest, into the presence of the Lord. And when he enters the sanctuary, a sound will be heard before the Lord. And when he exits, so that he does not die, whenever you went into the king's court, you announced your arrival. And those bells do that. And then verse 36 says, you or to make a pure gold medallion and engrave it, like the engraving of a seal. And what are they supposed to write on the medallion? Holy, holy to the Lord. Now notice it says, fasten it to a cord of blue yarn so that it can be placed on the turban. 
And the medallion is to be on front of the turban, and it will be on Aaron's forehead, so that Aaron may bear the guilt connected with the holy offerings that the Israelites consecrate as all their holy gifts. And it is always to be on his forehead so that they might find acceptance with the Lord. And different people have different opinions on exactly what's going on there, but there's a recognition Aaron is not perfect. Aaron in and of himself is not holy, but he's wearing this medallion that says across his forehead, says holy to the Lord. And there's something significant about bearing the guilt even right in front of him, right on his forehead. So we've got things close to the heart. We've got things on the shoulder and we've got something right on the forehead reminding them of who they are before the Lord. It's all that is again in prep, like draw, design the clothes in that way. So when Aaron goes before me, all of this is being symbolized. God carrying, God clo- close, to, close to God's heart in, in holiness right in front and center. So those are the clothes. But there's also this ancient ceremony of, of consecration, of preparation. So again, before one sacrifice for sin is made. There's like, uh, again, and, and sometimes we have to take a step back in time to appreciate how intricate this ceremony is. And you can look at chapter 29. I think there's 46 verses in this chapter. So that's more than the Exodus is devoted to how this ceremony needs to go down to prepare for, to prepare for Aaron coming into God's presence. So I just want to highlight a couple of these things that happen in the ceremony of consecration. We're not going to look at every single thing, but I want you to notice some elements because I think they're significant. First of all, there's water in verse four. It's, a, it's cleansing. So there's a big basin and before, any, before you take one step into the tent, like there has to be some sort of cleansing, assuming that whatever the high priest is, he can't just like go into God's presence unclean. And then there's something else that happens in verse five to nine, there's, and this is chapter 29, there's oil, there's oil that's dedicated, dedication oil, and it's poured over, it's poured over Aaron, you can imagine the oil running down, and the message is clear with the oil, like, you are dedicated to God, you belong to him, you're his, you're doing his work, you're here on his terms, so we have water to cleanse, we have oil consecrating, but then it turns bloody, And again, none of this is the sacrifice for sin just yet. This is to prepare the priest to even come into the Lord's presence. But the first animal that dies is a bull. In verses 10 to 14, the bull functions as a sin offering for Aaron to make sure he's ready. And blood from this offering, like again, it's it's reminding us something dies so that atonement can be made. And the blood from that bull is applied to the altar set apart as like this altar, something sacred is going to happen on this altar. So that's the first animal that's killed. The second animal that's killed is a ram in verse 15 to 18. Ram number one is killed. Aaron and his sons are told to put their hand on it. And then, and then that ram is slaughtered. I mean, this is, this is brutal and it's bloody, but it's reminding something dies so that sin can be atoned for. Something dies for you to enter God's presence because you're filled with sin. And so they, it's almost like they transfer the weight of their sin onto this animal and they burn the animal. It's a burnt offering. That's ram number one. Ram number two is also killed. So now we, I mean, you're counting. We have three animals that are killed. What's done with this is a little bit different with ram number two. So the blood from that ram is applied to Aaron. It says it, it, they touch just a little bit of the blood, touches his ear. A little bit of the blood will touch his hands, a little bit of the blood is applied to his feet, and a little bit is applied to the robe. And I think about the, what he hears, what he touches, where he goes, what he does, where he walks. All of that is meant to like, he's doing holy work. This is holy business. Like if God's going to dwell with people, do you, do you see the links? And then a portion of the second ram is burned up and a portion is eaten. So it is a reminder of God is communing, like what is it? It's most human to eat. And so they eat together in God's presence with a part of this ram. And then right at the end of the kind of that ceremony of consecration is the, like a focal point is that altar. And it's like said, it's like a very, very special place, a very, very holy place. So you have water, you have oil, you have a bowl, you have two rams, you have an altar. And you step back and you realize like, I mean, this is again, different from our world. 
I mean, we just walked in that door and we started singing today. Uh, I studied hard and tried to prepare, but there was no ornate ritual that I went to to handle God's word. Uh, Neither did any of the musicians. No animals died. There's no special anointing oil that we have somewhere locked in a cabinet for just special occasions. Like, I, I just want you to appreciate all of the symbols and all of the significance. God cares so much. He is trying to teach them what all this involves. And so what strikes me, though, as you get to the end of chapter 29, is that happens to, like, prepare Aaron so that he can prepare the people for God to live with them. But then it says in verse 38, there's something that happens not just one time or occasionally when there's a new high priest, but actually it happens daily. Look at verse uh, 38 of chapter 29. He says, now this is what you're to offer regularly on the altar. How often? Every day. So this isn't just going to happen one time. For God to live among his people, this is going to happen to have to happen every day. So there's two year old lambs. And in the morning you offer one lamb. And at twilight you offer the other lamb. With the first lamb you offer two quarts of fine flour mixed with one quart of oil from crushed olives, a drink offering of one quart of wine. And then you offer the second lamb at twilight. You offer a grain offering and a drink offering with it, like the one in the morning, as a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. Did you catch that? In the morning, one lamb dies, and there's a food offering. At twilight, another lamb dies. And the next day you wake up, and it happens again. And the next day it happens again. And the next day it happens again. And as the smoke goes up, God accepts these people. God, all, all the preparation is coming into place for God to dwell with them, to live with them. All the water, the oil, the blood, the death, the offerings, the sacrifices. And it says in verse 42, this is where I really do want to focus our attention. It says, this will be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord. He says, that is where I will meet you to speak with you. You see that throughout your generations. This is not one and done for God. So the next generation, and the one after that, and the one after that, and the one after that, God is saying, I'm not just meeting with you, but I've made a covenant to to you permanently. And I will meet, and I've got more instruction to give, and I'm going to tell you how to live. And he says, I will also meet, in verse 43, I will also meet with the Israelites there. And that place will be consecrated by my glory. And you think the Israelites, the Israelites, what? What's special about them? What's unique about them? And you come to the conclusion like, well, they're special because God's chosen to love them. They're not special because of anything intrinsically because of, of who they are. By the, by the end of Exodus, they've already fumbled around. They've already messed up massively. There's nothing intrinsically in them except for God has chosen to love them and meet with them. And he says, I will dwell with them. I will dwell among the Israelites. In verse 45, I will be their God, and they will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, so that I might dwell among them. And notice how the chapter ends, I am the Lord their God. What do we do with this? Uh, I mean, maybe ancient, like, priestly garments interest you, or maybe not. Maybe ancient ceremonies interest you, or maybe not. What, what I think this applies to us is I, I think it gives us a category that we, we have to make sure we have, and it gives a most important connection. So can I talk about the category that I think this drives home to us? Before you can appreciate how close God comes to you, this helps you appreciate how distant you would be if God, if God did not take the initiative. You read of all these links, all these animals that had to die, all the order and all the sequence, And you realize, this is not people going like, I know a plan to get us to God. I know what we could do. We could do this, and then we could do this, and then we could make this, and this would be really pretty, and this would be really beautiful, and this might be very meaningful. There's none of the people directing this. It is all God directing this. If God doesn't take the first step, we're lost. We're devastated. If God doesn't say, here's how you come to me, here are the terms, 
we're in the dark, we'd never know. We'd never guess it. We'd never have enough holiness in and of ourselves to go, look, Lord, I behaved a whole week. I didn't say anything mean all week long. I didn't have one nasty thought. I, I didn't have one materialistic impulse. I didn't have one lustful, envious thought. I mean, none of us are going to get there. None of us can take the first step that way. But here is a God who moves toward us. Do you have that category? Do you have that category of God being transcendent and above and holy? I want you to know God is with you, but I also want you to have the category that God is so far above us. God is not our buddy and he's not our life coach. God is holy. There's no one like him. He's not our butler. He's not our maid. We don't snap him into our life when we want him and then kind of tell him, nah, I got this. I'll holler when I need you. It does not work that way. This can emphasize that his nature his nature is not like ours, only a little better. Like it's a category difference. Do we know the holiness of God? Are you driven by that? Do you appreciate how devastating the distance would be for us? Do you realize, like they must have realized, every day you wake up and every time you go to bed at, at, sun, at, at sunrise and at twilight, another animal dies, reminding them you're not enough on your own. All of your good intentions, all of your well, you know, well thought out plans, it's not enough. I think this drives home the holiness. What does it look like for God to meet with people? So I, I think this like drives that category into us, even though we don't have the ceremony and the clothes or the tent. But I also want you to see a connection. I want you to appreciate that everything that we read in Exodus, I mean, there's a lot of chapters of it, right? Chapter 25 and through 27 is the tent. 28's the close, 29 to 31's the, the ceremonies. All of that in Scripture is a shadow. That's what Scripture says it is. It's a shadow, and we're not impressed with the shadow. We're impressed with what causes the shadow. We're impressed with the building. Like we're, we're not just looking at the shadow. We're tracking with the shadow to see, okay, what's the reality that creates this kind of shadow? And so I want you to appreciate exactly what this shadow is like what the reality is that's casting this long shadow in Exodus. And the reality is Jesus. This is what's casting this whole shadow. Jesus, all the shadows, all the signs are pointing to him. The one that we said, I will build my life upon his word. It's a firm foundation, worthy of every song we could ever sing. Like, no, this is him. See, all this is meant to make sure we don't miss him. We don't miss what it means that he came to dwell with us and to dwell with us on a permanent basis. I think about the connections and some of the, some of the differences, the contrasts. You know, Jesus is called, and I, I read it earlier to begin our service, Jesus is called the great high priest. But it's so, so different with Jesus when he shows up in flesh, God in flesh, different from the elaborate elaborate garments. I mean, we're not, we don't read that Jesus wore a robe with all sorts of like precious gemstones on it. As a matter of fact, I thought about what Jesus wore and two times his robe, maybe more, but at least a couple times it comes up. One of those times that Jesus' robe, what he's wearing comes, is when he was passing through a crowd and a lady just tries to touch him and like tries to reach hold, just maybe she could be well by touching his garment, by touching his robe. But the other time I thought about this garment, this robe that Jesus wears, is actually at the end of his life. And so it's a brutal story. It's a brutal story when he is actually stripped of his robe. So instead of this beautiful robe that has all sorts of significance and meaning, Jesus is stripped of his ordinary robe. And if that's not enough, what they decide to do, the Roman soldiers, they decide to gamble on it. And it's a game of chance with this robe of the great high priest who's come to make atonement. I think of the contrast, too, of uh, Jesus who, instead of a, a medallion or this great like crown that he might wear, the crown that he has doesn't say holy to the Lord. It's a crown of thorns made by his enemies, again, just to mock him and go, oh, you're really the king. You're really authoritative here. Such a different picture, isn't it? Our great high priest. I think of all the attention given to the anointing oil and how sacred that oil was. 
And then I think of a moment where Jesus comes in contact. It's like the only time the anointing oil seems to come up with Jesus is when a lady who had a tough past, who everybody goes like, what's she doing here? Why is she taking Jesus' time? Surely he should know. She should be nowhere close to him. And instead, she's the one who anoints Jesus with precious oil. And even that whole thing seems to go down as like, what's she doing? Do you, do you see the contrast of like such a beautiful picture and such like important and, and significant symbolism? And, and we, we come to Jesus. He never intentionally sets up like sacred space. He doesn't, it says he doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. There is, he doesn't create an altar that we all could go visit, some sort of shrine that Jesus himself made. None of that. He, he actually is the altar. I think about the blood that Jesus shed and the blood that's most connected with Jesus isn't, oh, when he killed that bull that one time or that ram to somehow make something clean. It's actually, no, the blood that matters most in connection with Jesus is his own. And it's not blood shed in something um, that made everybody go like, wow, what a beautiful story. He's just publicly shamed and executed. And he bleeds out on the cross as he's struggling for, for his breath. But that blood is significant, isn't it? Because that blood is the blood that atones for sin. That blood, not just, you know, it's for the sins of the world. Blood that consecrates sinners to God, making them holy, making them clean. And it's hard to think if we were at the cross, what we would not say is, wow, what a pleasing aroma. What a beautiful smell. None of us would think that. It would be an awful place. The smells would be terrible. And yet Paul, years later, would go, you know, many people find that what happened on the cross, like the stench of death, like, ah, it's terrible. But to those of us who are being saved, it, it, it does have this aroma of life to it. It is a sweet smelling sacrifice because we know because of what Jesus did there, we're actually now counted righteous. It's what we're accepted. I thought a lot about the priest and all the, man, all the different activity that had to go in to making sure he was appropriately consecrated and ordained to make the sacrifice. And then I thought of Jesus who is holy in and of himself. Like he didn't need anybody to make him holy. He's eternally holy. He's eternally perfect. He doesn't need any symbol to go like, oh, he's kind of a righteous person. No symbol needed. He's righteous in and of himself. Jesus, who is holy in and of himself. Jesus also, though, who makes us holy, who makes you holy. And, and the holiness, he, he needs no tent to do it. He needs no special clothes to do it. He needs no special ceremony to do it. But scripture says that those who believe in Jesus, they are in Christ. It's what Ephesians says. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy. Why did he choose us? To be holy, to set us apart, to make us his, dedicated to him. It says in Colossians 3, therefore, as God's chosen ones, you are holy and dearly loved. Think of all the intricate plans and the tent, the clothes, the ceremonies. And then I think of Jesus just extending that holiness to us, extending that holiness to you, and he knows exactly who he's getting. People who will disappoint themselves and disappoint many other people, he makes them holy. People who will sin and sin and sin again. He makes them holy. People who will lose things that matter to them, lose people that matter to them, he makes them holy. People who will struggle with all kinds of things. People who will struggle with mental illness. People who will struggle with eating disorders. People who will feel a truckload of shame maybe over something they did, maybe over something that, that was done to them, he'll make them holy. He'll set them apart. He'll make them his. People who have dysfunctional families, people who will struggle a long time because they've been sinned against, because they've been abused. Do you realize it's Jesus who has come to make you holy? Do you know that he has? If you don't know that, you could know that today. You could place your faith in him 
and his holiness would extend to you. You would be part of his holy people. I think about that too as we meet. This is what, this is what has happened. Jesus is present with us. He meets with us. He actually dwells with us. I don't know what you think of a church. I don't know if you think of it kind of as a religious club. It's not the way Jesus thinks about it. He thinks about it like this is his holy people. We walked in the door, and I don't know that I felt especially holy today. We walk in the door, and I'm looking at brothers and sisters in Christ who are holy people because of what Jesus has done. It's not a club. I'm not here to check a box. The goal here isn't like, well, let's just try to cram as much, many people as we can in a room to feel good about ourselves that we're, we got something going on here. It's not about that at all. It's about a room that gathers together in the name of Jesus, the one who has made us holy. As you walk out, you're going to look at people. You're going to look at people whom God has made holy. You're going to look at people that God has chosen to possess. He said, you're mine. You're mine. You're mine. And he's so deeply invested in us, giving us purpose and meaning. God has come to, in Jesus to meet with us. God has come through his spirit to dwell in us. And God has made us holy. And the beautiful picture of this is God is making us holy and he puts us as holy people in this world. And, we, and here's our mission. Our mission is extending that holiness, extending God's possession throughout as many people, as wide as we can as possible. We want to extend that invitation. There's always room for more. So how do we conclude? I, I'd, you're welcome to think about closing ceremonies all afternoon long. What I'd really love for you to do, though, is take that shadow and point it right back to Jesus. And in a moment, I'd love for you to sing with full-hearted worship, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Christ alone, cornerstone. Weak people made strong, sinners made holy. I'd love for you to live in that worship. Be renewed by that every single day. Let me pray. Father, you heard us sing that holy, there is no one like you. So you must know how it staggers us to think you have made us holy. That holiness is now extended to people who are anything but holy on our own. So mark out your people, and I pray we would live a life of worship and gratitude, dependence on you. Without you, we can't do anything. So I pray that any lies that are in our head that would cause us to believe we are untouchable would melt away. Any shame we would feel that would make us feel uh, very, very unholy and unclean, that we would look to the cross of the one who endured all sorts of shame and we would find, yes, we have been made holy and we are dearly loved. So you can do what I can't. These are just words, but your word can change us and your spirit can bring new life where there was death and guilt and shame. So do that for the glory of Jesus, we ask it in his name. Amen.